Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I've uh, I've looked for the quietest corner of, of the house to do this, and I think I've also found quite a dark corner of the house, but uh, it looks a bit um, gloomy and Halloween-y, but I'm in Denmark where it's a cold autumn evening, so it's probably fitting. I know some of you are just starting the day. Um, I'm Lisa Hansen. I'm a veterinary surgeon and a homeopath. I started out my um, career, of course, in, in conventional practice. And then I did some postgraduate training in homeopathy. And for more than 20 years now, I have been uh, concentrating on seeing um, chronically ill dogs and cats and a few horses. Um, so animals who haven't been able, haven't been, um, well, obviously haven't been cured, but haven't been able to find the help that they needed through the the conventional system, and then they end up um, seeing someone like me. Okay. Um, just a quick mention of my book that came out last year. I, everything I'm going to say today, I think, is covered in the book. So if everyone's interested, there's um, a lot more information in there. We've got about an hour, and I've got an ambitious plan um, to talk a lot about, to cover a lot of, um, of what I've got to say about homeopathy. Uh, absolutely my favorite topic. Um, I want to talk about what it is, how it works, what it can do for dogs. Um, I really, really want more people to be aware um, of what homeopathy can, be, can do for, for chronically ill dogs and, and very seriously ill dogs. There are a lot of animals who are not getting the help that they could get um, just because the carers aren't aware and, and the vets aren't aware very often. And not very often people are told this is incurable um, and nothing can be done. Um, and then when we do treat them with homeopathy, people are sometimes, to be honest, quite upset that, that help was there and, and they were never told. So what I'm really here for is to talk about what we can do with homeopathy and hope that, that you'll help me, help me tell more people about this. Um, I want to both talk about uh, a little bit about my my daily work and, and how I approach uh, an ill animal, but also cover, if you're interested, how you can try to experiment with this at home and, and try to, well, play around with it, because it's a very exciting thing to play around with. Now, first of all, I think it's really important before we sort of dive into the the hands-on stuff about the remedies and et cetera, et cetera, um, to talk a little bit about what it is and how it, how it works. Um, my website, my company um, is called Alternative Vet, which is sort of ironic because I struggle with the term alternative. Uh, it mostly came about because you couldn't have a, a website called homeopath homeopathic or homeopathy because no one can spell it. Um, so I'm now alternative vet, but I do think it's a problematic term. It doesn't say anything. It just says you're something other than, than the others, um, which is a bit nonsensical. Um, what I think we should be talking about is, is holistic. It's a, it's, um, we should talk about holism. We should talk about the holistic approach. That may also be a term these days that's being thrown around sometimes as a bit of a cliche without us really knowing what, what does it really mean. I mean, politicians talk about holistic solutions these days, and I'm quite sure they don't know what they mean by it. Um, when I talk about a holistic approach in medicine, the, the main point is that it's an approach that involves looking at the whole individual looking at the whole, um, not just looking at the, the symptom or the illness or the problem or the organ um, that, that has a problem, but looking at the whole individual and really zooming out sometimes more than that, looking at that individual, not just the whole of that individual here and now, but also um, that individual in time. You know, if you're looking at an ill dog, talking about, what what else has been happening um, through this dog's life? What was were there any ailments when he was a puppy? Um, looking at the whole medical history and and seeing the pattern um, the patterns that are so often there, even if the problems uh, on the face of it are 
completely different illnesses, completely different symptoms. When you look at the whole picture, it involves looking at everything that has been going on with that animal through time. Also looking out, zooming out even further and looking at the situation, you know, what's the, what's the household situation? What's the family situation? Has another pet just arrived? Has another pet just died? Has there been a divorce in the family? Has there been a, you know, have you moved house? Uh, has there been building work going on? Did the neighbor just get a Rottweiler? Um, did, you know, children just move off to, to for college or, all these dynamics, all these things that have been going on around the individual become important when you look at the whole picture and not just the sore that needs healing or the infection that needs healing or, or whatever the problem, the problem is. That's a very important part of holistic treatments, and I'm sure that applies to many other holistic treatments that, than just homeopathy, um, but it is something that characterizes your approach when you're looking at it um, holistically. Just to look slightly more on that, bear with me, this is as theoretical as, as I'm planning to get today, and I'm gonna illustrate it with a story in a minute. But I think it's important to, to be aware of the differences between um, the holistic approach to the left, in this case, the homeopathic approach, and the opposite, which would be the conventional approach. Um, to, to give it a more meaningful description, I would call it um, a reductionistic approach, an approach where you, if someone comes in with an ulcer, that ulcer is the entirety of the problem and, and your job um, as a vet or as, as the person who's treating this patient is to remove that ulcer. That's what I call the reductionistic approach. Um, we could call it the, the conventional approach. The reason I think this is important to just briefly be aware of how different these two approaches is. Uh, it came to me recently, someone was, uh, someone contacted me because they wanted me to look at a dog. She had a dog with an allergic um, itch, very, very common problem. Um, and she said it responds beautifully to steroids. But as soon as we stop giving steroids, the problem comes back. Now I've heard that homeopathy can help with this. Is it as, effect is it as effective as steroids was the problem, was the question, sorry. And that seems on the face of it to be a, a reasonable question, but it's a very difficult question to give a short answer to, which is why I'm asking for five minutes here to give the, the slightly longer answer, I suppose. If you look at it, when a patient comes into the clinic and you treat them holistically, then you look at the whole individual and you have to appreciate that 10 individuals, this could be 10 dogs, you could have 10 black female Labradors with a hotspot or with recurring hotspots. Um, if you look at that conventionally or from a reductionistic point of view to the right side of my slide here, you will the problem will be to remove the hotspot. And as a vet or a practitioner, your approach will be the same. You'll have 10 dogs, same problem, same treatment. If they come in and you're offering them a holistic approach, you have to look at these as 10 different cases and they're going to end up getting 10 different treatments. Um, certainly when you're looking at the slightly deeper acting treatment um, where you're not just looking to remove that hotspot or that ulcer here and now, you're looking to cure the tendency or the weakness in that animal's immune system to stop them coming back again and back again and back again as they otherwise uh, will. But the point is that you have to look at each individual. So you can never say, this is my treatment for hotspots if you're a homeopath. There is never a direct link in homeopathy between a diagnosis or a problem and a treatment. There is no such thing as a remedy for, because you're not just looking at the problem and the symptom or the illness or the diagnosis, you're looking at the individual. So the same problem in 10 different individuals or in 100 different individuals will probably ne need a specific individual treatment for each individual. That's a very, very important difference. Another important difference is how you look at a symptom. If you're treating conventionally, the symptom is the problem and all you have to do is make the symptom go away. So if there's diarrhea, you stop the diarrhea. If there's a, an ulcer or a, a rash, 
eczema, you stop the rash and then you've done what you're supposed to do. If you approach that problem holistically, you see, obviously, the symptom is going to go away. Uh, that's the end result. But initially, you really see the symptom primarily as a useful indication that here is an individual that's out of balance. Here's an individual that needs some help. Um, and the symptom is the way that individual or that organism expresses that need for help. So you study the symptom uh, to get as much information as you can out of it. Um, and you see it as a call for action, but you don't really see it as something that you just have to cover up and, and make, make it go away. It's more of a reason to, to delve deeper. When you've then treated the patient um, conventionally by removing the symptom, if it was a rash, maybe you put a steroid or an antibiotic cream on it, um, all you've done is remove that symptom. It may come back in the future, um, but you've removed it right now. And you've removed it by doing applying an external influence that, that stopped that symptom, stopped the itch, stopped whatever was perceived to be the problem. When you treat holistically and go much deeper, using the symptom as, a, as an indication that you need to go deeper and study this, this whole individual, um, it's very typical that the end result will be that that whole individual will have reached a higher level of health. Very, very often when an animal comes back for a, a follow-up consultation, the owners will mention um, maybe an, I had an example of a dog that came in with chronic ear infections. Um, we spent a lot of time, you know, I normally spend an hour with the first, for the first consultation. So we're talking about all aspects of, of that dog and his life. Um, and his, his, his health and everything there is to say about him, really, um, and give a remedy that fits all of that. And then when they come back for the follow-up, it's very typical that hopefully the, the complaint that brought them to see me has cleared up. But very often they will also say things like, um, in this particular case, the owner said he's had a limp on his left front leg ever since he was a young dog and had, had some surgery there. Um, that's disappeared as well. Could that, could that really be connected? And that's a very typical sign that you've, you've gone deeper and you've given that um, individual a boost on a much deeper level. So they're actually at a higher level of general health than they were, than they were before, um, which is, you know, much more something quite rather more ambitious, I would say, than just removing a specific symptom. Very often things have gone away that I, I weren't even aware of. Um, and what you're doing when you're treating holistically is you're stimulating that individual's capacity for self-healing. I don't really believe that, that anything can, you know, I don't think I can heal anybody. Um, all you can do is help the, each individual organism, each individual patient heal themselves just by giving them a boost and, and showing them how. Uh, but the fact that you're stimulating their self-healing means that you get these Last, lasting effect, and you get effects on areas that, that haven't even been discussed sometimes. Whereas to the rise of, of my picture, when you are um, suppressing a symptom, like if you're taking away an itch by using steroids, antibiotics, you're doing it through an external influence that's working against the, the reaction of the body. And very, very typically, it'll work brilliantly um, here and now, but as soon as you stop, um, your medications, the problems very often recur. Okay, this is my favorite story. I was going to skip it, but uh, but then I changed my mind at the last minute. After all, um, it's it, to me it illustrates uh, what I've just been saying. Um, just very briefly, if if one of us is this car, you know, this car is one of us or one of our dogs. It is an an individual, an organism who's busy living their life. Uh, zooming along, and suddenly they develop an annoying um, problem. They develop a symptom. So if it's me or you or one of our dogs, it could be an itchy rash. In this car, let's say it's the oil lamp flashing. The oil lamp is flashing, and this flashing blinking light is, um, is disturbing. It's frustrating the drive for the driver. It's disturbing the driving. If you're driving at night, it can be really annoying having this light flash in your face. Um, if you treat if you treat a rash by putting a steroid cream on it, 
maybe a bit of uh, systemic steroids or some antibiotics, you know, you're, you, you, you may feel that you're seeking appropriate help, you're dealing with the, with the, with the, the problem, but what all you're really doing is this reductionistic approach where you're suppressing the symptom. You're, you're seeing the symptom as the entirety of the problem. If you do that to this car, the equivalent would be that you take a piece of black tape and you cover the oil lamp. Problem solved. But what's going to happen um, at some point, most likely, the, maybe the tape is going to come loose and the, the blinking light, the flashing light is going to become annoying again, which is very often what happens with itchy dogs once the treatments wear off, the itch comes back. But then you can do it again and you can become quite good at applying this treatment. You know, you can all, you, you don't really have to sh slow down the car at all to reach into the glove compartment and put some more black tape on. And this is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the story, but I am quite seriously saying that this is what we're doing if we're, if a dog gets cystitis and we give it antibiotics and three months later it has cystitis again and we give it antibiotics and six months later it has cystitis again and we give it antibiotics or hotspots or ear infections or whatever else the problem may be. If all we're doing is covering up the symptom and making it go away for a while so it, it's not annoying to us or to the dog, we're really just sticking on more and more black tape um, on, the, on the warning light rather than listening to it. If you were to take a holistic approach to this car with its flashing light, then you need to invest a little bit more time uh, into finding out what's going on. You know, you need to get off the road, you need to open the bonnet, you need to examine the car, uh, work out what the problem is, solve the problem. And when you've done that, the oil lamp is going to stop its annoying symptom all by itself, even though you've never touched it. Um, because you've listened to it um, and you've allowed it to lead you to a more thorough investigation of this problem and a more lasting solution to the problem. And characteristically, when this car then continues on its journey, it's actually in better shape than it was two minutes before the oil lamp started flashing. And that's very typical when you've treated a patient uh, holistically, as I mentioned before. You know, people will say things like, oh, we thought he was just getting older, but, you know, this six-year-old dog has started bringing toys and, you know, throwing balls, rolling balls at us and wanting to play um, since we treated the ear infection, just because something has, has given them a, a much deeper lift, so to speak. Okay. But the key words of holistic treatment, and this is what I'm getting at, you, you have to look at the individual. You can't just say this is a case of cystitis, this is a case of ear infections, what's the homeopathic remedy? And you have to study each individual to, to find out what they need to make them healthier for their problem to go away. And when you do that, you have to look at the whole, whole problem, not just the bladder, the whole picture I was gonna say, not just the bladder or the ears, um, but you have to look at that whole individual, um, look at the whole individual in time, look at the whole individual in including the, situ the circumstances that they're, that they're living under. Um, treat the patient, not the disease, really says it all. Okay. Now, go going more into homeopathy. Homeopathy was... I keep wanting to say it was invented, but of course it wasn't. It must be a, a principle of nature, but it was, dis it was discovered uh, by Samuel Hahnemann in the late 1700s. He was um, uh, one of these brilliant people that come around um, who just think deeper and, and see things that the rest of us don't see, I think. Um, he found out that, I'm not going to go into details with it because time won't allow, but he found out that tiny dosages he made this medicine let me show this one he made this medicine um by making these extreme dilutions following a very specific process um and he did a huge huge scientific uh, groundwork experimenting on friends and neighbors um very systematically describing how to make the medicines and how to apply the medicines um, this has been, in some countries more than others, but there has been some controversy about homeopathy because of the way these remedies are made. 
Uh, so I'm just going to touch on it very briefly and then return to it later when, when talking about the remedies. Um, homeopathic medicine in principle can be made from any substance. You start with um, the vial on the left of the picture, what we call the mother tincture, which is a, a solution in water of an alcohol of the original substance that this remedy is going to be made from. Most remedies are made from plants, um, but it can also be minerals. It, it can be anything, really. Uh, but what you do is you have a, a dilution of the substance in your the first glass, the first vial on the left of this picture. Then you take one drop, moving on to the second uh, vial or tube here, and you dilute that one drop with 99 drops of, of water and alcohol. And then you shake it. We call it succussion. It's very well described exactly how, how filled these uh, vials have to be and how much and how vigorously you have to, to succuss them. Um, and then you take, then you end up this first one because it's a one drop to 99 drops. Um, it's called a 1C because it's a centesimal scale, 1 to 100. Then you shake it and then you take one drop of that and add to another 99 parts of water and alcohol and succuss it again. And then you take one drop to another 99 parts and shake it again. So very, very quickly, you end up with a very, very, very thin dilution. And very quickly, you move beyond Avogadro's number, meaning that statistically, there isn't going to be a single molecule left of the material that you started out with. So homeopathic remedies, you start with a physical substance, often a plant, and you go through this many, many, many times. The, the fourth, the last uh, vial in this picture is a 3C, and often the, the dilutions that a homeopath uses may be, may be a 200C or, or much higher than that. So it's gone through this one drop to 99 drops of, of water and alcohol, and then one drop to 99 drops 200 times. So if you do a chemical analysis of, of what, you've, what you've got there, it's going to be water and alcohol and nothing else. And that's obviously a challenge to, well, to most uh, rational minds, I, I would suspect. It was certainly um, challenging for me as a young vet when I started looking at homeopathy. Um, and in the end, I just had to tell myself that surely there must have been lots and lots of examples through, through human history of things that we've done and things that we've known to be effective before we could explain how they were, what, what the mechanism behind them were. Uh, and it was so, it's so very clear when you start working with homeopathy how amazingly effective it is um, that, certainly for me personally, I was able to put, put that aside, but it was a frustration all the same not to be able to explain exactly how it worked. And certainly you... Um, are at the receiving end as a practitioner, um, you know, among veterinary colleagues, of a lot of jokes about, you know, you put one drop of something in a swimming pool and and then you use it to to cure serious disease. It it sounds a bit mad. Um, thankfully, uh, science is is catching up fast. Um, this is a picture from 2008. This is the uh, King of Sweden uh, to the right, and a French scientist to the left called Luc. Uh, Montagnier, who is receiving the Nobel Prize in Medicine. So you don't really get more scientific than this. Ironically, sometimes um, people who argue against homeopathy, who find this, this hurdle of, of, of the extreme dilutions um, too much to accept, will, will say that they're doing so from a scientific standpoint. But actually, science is describing this now. Uh, as I said, this was from 2008. Um, he got the Nobel Prize in Medicine for uh, describing the link between um, HIV virus and AIDS. But already, um, when uh, Mr. Montagnier is standing here shaking hands with the Queen, with the, uh, <laughs> the King of Sweden, he is already um, researching the mechanisms behind homeopathy. And and uh, the following year, he started uh, publishing. Um, he describes uh, electromagnetic sig signals that can be measured coming from the homeopathic uh, potencies. 
um, which which makes sense because when you talk when you talk about the the extreme dilutions being a problem to our acceptance and understanding of homeopathy, we are of course coming from a point of view of, of, of chemistry, uh, approaching this or trying to approach it uh, scientifically, and chemistry, I think personally is where all the big discoveries were made in the last, um, you know, the 1900s. That's when, that's when, and before, that's when chemistry were discovering um, new, you know, that's where the big steps were being made. But today, exploring space, all the, all the advances that are happening today, physics uh, is playing a much bigger part. And this is what, um, uh, Mr. Montagnier is saying, he's saying the answer is not in, we're not going to find the answer um, through chemistry. Uh, we're going to find the answer looking at it um, through physics. Um, and like I said, he says it's an uh, electromagnetic um, resonance, which is specific to each remedy and each level of dilution of the remedies. It's very interesting um, reading these articles. Okay. Getting more specific, I would like to talk about, um, I've said already, and this is a really important thing to, to hang on to, is that when we treat homeopathically, it is not a remedy for a condition. There is not, there is no such thing as a homeopathic remedy for um, eczema or a homeopathic remedy for asthma because you're treating the patient, not the disease. So to, there is certainly, um, if you have a patient with asthma or a patient with eczema, they can most likely be cured through, homo through homeopathy, but you need to take the time and effort to examine that individual and find the exact remedy that they need. And it'll be a different remedy from the one that another 100 patients with the same problem may need. Um, and this is at the same time, I think the, the strength of homeopathy that you that it is it is possible to go in very, very delicately and specifically for each individual and find um, what is needed to restore them to health, to, to help them find balance and to give them that boost that they need. But it is obviously also the challenge because it's time consuming and it's it would be nice. I get so many emails um, every day from people saying, oh, I've heard you've, you've cured this dog who had chronic eczema. This, my dog does too. What shall I give him? And I wish I could say, I wish I could tell them, but obviously I don't have a clue because I don't know that particular dog and we need to start over, um, which is what makes it exciting, but it is also what, what you know, it, it takes time, it takes resources. People need to come and, and see a homeopath to find out what remedy they need. At the same time, I want to uh, also today um, just touch upon how you can try homeopathy at home if you haven't done so already. Uh, and that sounds like I'm contradicting myself, which is what this slide is supposed to explain. Um, the need for individuality in the prescription when you take a remedy is absolutely necessary if you are treating a problem that mostly that comes from the individual you know a problem that is that is about their um, tendencies weaknesses predispositions um, whereas if you have a, a problem that mostly came from a strong external influence um, like if you were exposed if you were exposed to a strong toxin, if you were hit by a bus, if you were exposed to a very pathogenic virus, a bacteria, if you got food poisoning. So if something very potent from the outside caused the disease, then you are, I mean, this graph may make sense to no one but me, but what I'm trying to show um, using it is that if the external force or the external cause is strong, so that anybody exposed to that would most likely exhibit the same symptoms, then you are way out um, to the right on the x-axis. And then the need for individuality and in the treatment more or less falls away. So if we're if if you're hit by a car or you know a roof falls on your head, 
then it doesn't really matter what kind of a person you are or what childhood diseases you've suffered from. Um, then most of us are going to have the, suffer from the same symptoms and therefore most of us are going to need the same treatment. Whereas if you have an allergic tendency, if you're a human, maybe you've got hay fever and it runs in your family or you've got migraines and it runs in your family or if you're a dog, it's the same thing really. Um, maybe there's epilepsy uh, in that line. Maybe there's allergies. Um, it, can, it can be, there's a whole range. But if, if it's mostly to do with the way that individuals put together, um, then we're right in on the left side of the x-axis and then you really need to apply an individually chosen treatment and what i would like to do um with um to, well now is show you first a couple of examples from my clinic of the left side where you need a, to a very specific individual treatment and then uh, a few things from the right side where it's much easier because it's it's much easier to give a remedy that will actually work. This is another way of saying the same thing. If you're talking about chronic disease, recurring problems, then you need what homeopaths call constitutional treatment. You need to deal with the way your body works um, and, and correct that or help that uh, find a balance. And then you really need to look at the whole picture, as I started out saying, look at the individual, look at the individual um, and and zoom out and look at everything. Um, and that's when you need that's when you need um, to go and see a specialist. You need to go and see a homeopath. Um, if it's an animal, go and see a veterinary homeopath. Um, if you try to treat cancer or allergies or, you know, asthma, whatever it is at home, whether it's um, in a human or in an animal, you're not very likely to find the right treatment um, and you may be disappointed. But if you're at the other end of the scale, scale uh, way out to the right of my graph that I showed before, dealing with first aid situations or dealing with very um, acute disease, then the individuality of the patient is less important and then it's much, much easier to find the right remedy and then it's much more satisfying to play around with homeopathy. Uh, because you're much more likely to see uh, results uh, and can see quite, you know, amazing results, miraculous results fairly easily, which is why I think this is, this is an important point. It may be ambitious of me to, to, to try and, and um, put it across in this format, but I'm ha very happy to take questions at the end if, if you know, don't, don't hold back. Okay, so a few words about my clinic. Um, I spend all day, every day, seeing uh, mostly dogs, uh, but also cats, who suffer from chronic problems. Um, they are all animals who've been to um, other vets lots of times, and they're not getting uh, better, or they get better briefly, and then the problem comes back. This is just sort of what... I haven't... Um, this is just... I just wrote this down today, thinking, what do I see the most of? I see by far in dogs most chronic skin disease, um, allergies, um, you know, recurring ear infections, dogs that lick their paws until they're red and raw and bleeding, hot spots, recurring hot spots, um, eczema, itchy dogs. Itchy dogs is a huge problem. Um, it is probably the biggest problem in any small animal veterinary practice. Uh, partly because it's incredibly common and partly because conventional veterinary medicine can't cure it. So if, as a vet, you see a puppy on the table coming in for one of its puppy vaccines and it's already maybe got yeasty ears or the skin is a bit pink and the owners are talking about, you know, it's really very itchy, you know, as a vet, that this is going to be a lifelong problem. Um, you can manage it. You can relieve the symptoms but you run into problems with with side effects of the treatment so it's it's a very big and very frustrating problem for owners for vets and and certainly I'm sure for dogs too um, and it's one that responds very very beautifully um, in many cases to to homeopathic treatment 
and it is what I spend most of my time doing. I also see a lot of dogs with um, IBD or IBS, um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, what you want to call it, you know, chronic diarrheas, um, either more or less all the time or bouts of diarrhea that, that keep coming back and typically keep coming back worse. Um, I, autoimmune disease is less common than allergies, but still um, a significant problem for dogs, uh, a problem that doesn't have an easy solution in the conventional system and one that very often responds uh, amazingly um, to homeopathy. I see dogs with false pregnancies. That is obviously, it's not really a disease. It's a normal hormonal phase, but it's, um, I suppose, like some women may suffer from normal uh, hormone, um, hom normal hormonal changes can, can affect some much more than others. Um, and in the same way, all dogs have false pregnancies, and but some dogs, some owners are never aware of them, and other dogs um, are really, um, I, I hesitate to say suffering, but, but in some cases you could call it that. But it's certainly very easily, anything hormonal is very easily treated with homeopathy. Um, you know, in humans, uh, more than dogs, it could be things like infertility or period pains or whatever, but in dogs it tends to be the false pregnancies. Um, hypothyroidism is well treated with, homeo with homeopathy. Pancreatitis, uh, if you've got chronic pancreatitis, um, I've got a, a lot of, of good cases of that. Um, and sometimes people come with, with dogs with behavioural problems. I don't treat that very much, um, and I would never treat it without also uh, making sure that they're seeing a behaviour risk. But sometimes homeopathy can help um, make them more trainable, really. Um, just help the training along. Okay, so treating these chronically ill animals where you really need to delve in and, and spend the time, uh, you know, opening the bonnet and looking at the root of the problem. Um, I spend an hour uh, the first time with a new patient. I could easily spend two or three, but it, it's, I can't make a living that way. So, and I can do it mostly in an hour. Um, but you could take much longer if it was available. Um, it's a lot about, it, people often comment that it's, uh, very often people are hesitant to come. If an anim, All the animals I see have been to the vet a lot, and some of them are very stressed by it. Um, and sometimes people say, you know, can we, can we, can, do we have to come? And, and they, or they warn me, you know, he's aggressive or he's very scared. But almost always they will comment afterwards that it wasn't like a normal vet visit. Um, I try to ignore the patient for nearly an hour. Uh, you know, the first 45, 50 minutes, I don't, I don't, um, I don't even look at them, really. They, I'm obviously observing the whole time. And as I'm talking to the, the carer and, and question, uh, questioning them about the animal's behavior, the animal's physical characteristics, you know, hunger, thirst, uh, do they feel heat, do they feel cold, how are they with other dogs, how do they react in a million different situations. Um, I am at the same time out of the corner of my eye keeping an eye on what the dog is doing um, and trying to, to decipher in a way their personality in that way. Um, I'm often asked if, if home visits don't give more information, and I don't think they do, because I think it's, it's easy to be cool if you're in your own house and you're on your own sofa, you can be laid back. But a dog coming into the clinic is slightly out of his comfort zone. They're, they're aware that they're stepping into a veterinary clinic, but at the same time, I'm just sitting there not even looking at them. So there's a lot of information to be gathered just from the behavior of the dog. You know, is he... Is he on my lap? Is he in my face, um, you know, knocking off my glasses, licking me? Um, or is he scratching at the door trying to leave? Or is he hiding under the owner's chair, sitting on the owner's lap, taking the room apart, trying to, you know, decipher all the scents left behind by previous patients? Um, it's all very good information about what sort of individual um, is this? Um, how do they... How, how do they react coming into a, a new room? Um, 
I obviously look at their medical history. Uh, most of the consultation is talking to the person that knows the animal the best. Whenever, um, I think it's typical for any veterinary homeopath, whenever we go to, to conferences with uh, human homeopaths, um, they will always say, how can you possibly treat an animal? They can't answer your questions. Um, and I think it's exactly like treating, like a, a human homeopath treating a baby. They can't answer your questions, but that you can certainly treat them and help them anyway, partly by observing them and partly by getting all the information out of the, the people who care for them and live with them. And, and dog carers, just like human parents, are incredibly um, incredible observers and will be able to tell you um, about their dogs. It's, um, it's normally a very, very nice and very interesting uh, conversations, finding out about the whole life of, of an animal like that. And, and generally, I think, for, for all parties. Um, at the end of the consultation, there's an analysis. I have to analyze uh, all the information uh, gathered and bring that all together into a prescription of a homeopathic remedy. It's really about knowing the homeopathic remedies. There's about just under 5,000 homeopathic remedies. I don't know them all, um, certainly not well, but knowing, knowing the important ones and knowing how to get to, to the others when they're relevant, uh, and then finding out about this particular patient and then bringing the two together. Okay. This is a uh, this is a uh, caricature almost. It's an extreme simplification, but it's just to illustrate how a homeopath thinks when you're when you're looking when you as I just described. You get to know the patient, and you want to bring about that match between the patient and the remedy. So I'm just what I thought I would do is very briefly and very simplified, just describe four, common, um, co four commonly used homeopathic remedies. When talking about patients and talking about remedies, um, and I write about this, there's much more of this in my book if, if anybody's interested, but it can sound confusing. Are you referring to the medicine now? Are you referring to the homeopathic remedy, the homeopathic medicine, or are you referring to the patient? Uh, and when we talk about these types, I'm really talking about both because it's all about recognizing the type in the animal so that you can give them um, the remedy. And when you bring the two together, that's when the, the, the cure happens. Um, I just said most of the remedies are plants. This is actually three remedies made from minerals and one made from a plant, but, but there you are. Um, it's just to illustrate how I think when I'm, or how any homeopath thinks when we're trying to, um, when we learn about the remedies and when we apply it to the patient, when you're treating individualized, when you're treating these chronic illnesses that need a very specific individual approach. Um, Natrum muriaticum or, or nat mule among friends um, is a type which is, I don't know how a horse picture got in here, but, but I suppose it illustrates the point that it doesn't matter. These are archetypes in a way. It doesn't matter whether it's a horse or a dog or a cat or a human. If the remedy, if the homeopathic remedy Nat Muir is going to cure that individual, these characteristics and a whole lot more will be present. They are reserved, they are introverts, they are sensitive, uh, often described as, as loners. They are not the ones that, if it's the dog we're talking about, this is not a dog that wants everybody you meet on the street to come and, 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 and pat your dog. You know, that would be incredibly stressful and inappropriate for a, a dog of a nat mior disposition. If everybody felt that they could just reach out and touch, then they don't want that. Um, it's typically the kind of dog where the owners, if, if I ask, you know, how, how cuddly are they? How close do they want to be? The owner will say, well, and they will almost always say it's on their terms. You know, it's the sort of dog that if it comes on your lap, then you sit very still and you feel, oh, ooh, it's a special. Um, they don't like to be picked up typically. They don't want to, they don't want you to come and, and hug them, but, but, Every now and then, on a, when they're in a in the right mood and you're sitting in the right way, and and they might come and just 
share um, a moment, um, but there's typically the kind of individuals where you're aware that this is special because they don't do it often and they don't do it with everybody. Um, on a physical, physical side, nap new individuals will always be quite thirsty. Um, and uh, by hot, I mean that they are individuals that um, don't seek heat. This will not be the dog that lies in front of, a, of an open fire or in the, the you know, sun, sun spot or sun bathe. This will be the dog that looks for the cool, shady, uh, maybe the dog that prefers to lie outside uh, when it's cool or the dog that goes under bushes or digs a hole to cool down. They tend to not like external heat. They'll, they don't want to be wrapped up in blankets and they, they feel that the world is is plenty hot enough. Um, this was the dog that was a nap mule. This is a Eurasia, which is obviously a, um, a reserved type of dog anyway, uh, which you have to take into account. But um, this had this dog uh, was brought to me because he had he'd never done a normal poo. Basically, it was all sort of pasty cow patty uh, stools, and he'd been on a million different diets. Um, when he ate. He would sort of suddenly jump and, and look behind as if there was some some discomfort or pain. He would look towards his rear end and he would he would seem in discomfort, but he had been thoroughly examined and, and no vet had been able to find any any problem with him. Um, but his stools were too loose. Um, so we talked about that, obviously, but mostly about all the other aspects of his his life and his character and his his habits and his desires uh, and I reached the the prescription Natmure and when he got Natmure um, I received a very excited email with a picture of a dog poo saying he's done his first normal stool ever um, which is which is what happens when when the right remedy is given the point to make absolutely clear here is that I'm not saying Natmure is a remedy for inflammatory bowel I'm saying that the nap mule was the remedy for this dog and therefore it cured his inflammatory bowel problem. Uh, another nap mule, this is uh, Poppy, uh, a lovely Chinese crested who I've seen quite recently, um, who had um, an itch from an early age. And you can see this is the, ins the inside of her thigh. Uh, you can see the, the, the lesions and the thickening and the, the inflammation. Uh, the picture to the right is the the outside of her thigh, where there is some inflammation, but mostly you can just see how she's been gnawing at herself and and lost uh, quite a lot of of hair as a consequence. She was also an abnormal individual that, that sort of sensitive, um, just thinks about things before jumping in, um, and lots and lots of other things that 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 pointed to abnormal. But she got abnormal, and she's much better. Um, the first consult I had with her, she was as soon as we sat down, she started itching and she itched for the whole hour. Um, and now she doesn't really do that anymore. She's the black and white dog, the third from the left with her with her dog family. Um, but she's um, got no, infl no inflammation left at all. And the only treatment she's had is, uh, is the homeopathic remedy, Nat Mio, because it suited her. Another homeopathic uh, type, which is very, very common, is pulsatilla. Uh, pulsatilla individuals are gentle. Pulsatilla seems to say with their whole being, just love me and take care of me. And it doesn't matter whether they are people or dogs or cats or horses. They just want to be held and loved and cuddled. And they want you to be gentle and they want to be good. Um, they are affectionate. They they can be a little bit quiet until you know them, but it doesn't take long. They're interested. They just need to know that that you're safe and you mean well. Um, on a physical level, they are not thirsty. They are the sort of dogs where invariably um, owners add water to their food because they don't drink. Well, they they, they don't feel thirsty. Um, they're also quite hot. Um, they wouldn't be seeking external uh, heat. They wouldn't be hugging the radiators or going under blankets. Um, and they like to be to be outdoors. OK, I'm going to speed up a little bit because there's a lot to say and I could talk forever, but I don't have forever. Um, this was an, an example of uh, uh, a Westie. 
um, who was a pulsatilla type, you know, how this was, yes, her axilla, I think her armpit, very inflamed, um, you know, how Westies can look, uh, skin allergies is a very common problem in Westies, and I've treated a lot of them, and they invariably uh, are curable, um, but obviously they, they need, I mean, if you take a hundred Westies with a paw that looks like this, they, any dog owner will know that a hundred Westies are as different from each other as a hundred people. Um, and once you delve into that and find the, the remedy that fits on a physical, behavioral, emotional level to each individual dog, you can cure these kind of problems. But there is no one remedy for Westies or Westies with, with bad, I think this is the wrong Westie that I've got mixed up in here. This was another pulsatilla dog. This is what she looked like when the owners first contacted me. Um, almost looks like she's just hypothyroid, but she's not. She was she was checked. This is partly the original skin complaint and partly she looks like this because of side effects of the steroids that she's on. Um, but we put her on pulsatilla and weaned her off the steroids and after a um, few months she looked like this. So you can get from that to that when the homeopathic remedy is right. And in her case, it was pulsatilla. In another case, it will be a different remedy. Sulfur, a very, very common remedy. Um, hot, laid back, confident, um, quite often enjoying getting a bit mucky. This was a dog that had um, also had chronic uh, recurring diarrhea and was cured by sulfur, unlike the Eurasia I showed before, who was cured by Nat Muir. So they had exactly the same diagnosis and conventionally the treatment would be the same. But when you treat with homeopathy, you need to look deeper and you need to look at the differences and the individual traits of each dog and the treatment will be different. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, and just talk about, this was the left, the examples that I gave here of these types, these constitutional types that homeopaths talk about, um, where you need to look at the whole individual are at the left of this graph, where you really need to get a, a specific remedy for each individual. I'm going to, to spend my last few minutes talking about the very right of the graph, um, where it's easier to um, see great results at home. In other words, talking about first aid and acute situations and how you might like to uh, play around with homeopathy. Some of you may be doing that already, but just a few. Um, well, this is the big one, really. Arnica is the homeopathic remedy for physical injury. From the tiniest bruise to you know, huge um, surgeries. Uh, Arnica can certainly make a difference between life and death. Anybody who's physically injured, any situation where there's bruising, so that's anything from sprains, strains, fractures, surgery. Of course, it's a situation where you know that tomorrow morning I'm gonna I'm gonna get injured. Uh, so I would suggest that anybody human or animal, if anyone's going in for surgery, even just, you know, dental. Um, if your dog is going in to have his teeth cleaned, maybe a couple of teeth removed, give them arnica before they go in and give them arnica when they come out. It makes a huge difference to bleeding, recovery, pain, swelling, recovery. Um, it can be very, very dramatic, the difference between giving arnica and not giving arnica in any situation with physical trauma. It really ought to belong in every household. Um, you can't overdo it. The main point I want to make about uh, using homeopathy at home is that it's easy to get confused because there are thousands of remedies and there's a lot of information out there. But these lots of homeopathic pharmacies make these kits where, in fact, the most important part of the kit is not in the picture. It's the little leaflet that just describes how the 18 or 36 or whatever size kit you get, um, how these remedies in here are commonly used. Uh, so that if you have um, a tonsillitis or <laughs> flu, um, gastric upset, whatever it may be, um, 
you've got the remedies at hand and you've got simple instructions on how to use them. It's, it's, I've, I've heard amazing examples of people curing really quite uh, significant symptoms by themselves in five minutes by just looking something up and having the remedy there. Um, the remedies that you use in for animals and the remedies that you use for people are exactly the same. Um, there is no difference at all. And you cannot do harm. The worst that happens if you take a homeopathic remedy and it's not the right homeopathic remedy um, for you at that time, then or for your dog at that time, then nothing will happen. It won't work. Okay. Uh, it, there is a common confusion about remedies and potencies, and there is no need for it really. My hope is that if you're not doing it already, you will, I can inspire you to go and play around with it a little bit, get some arnica, take it the next time you knock your head and see how the bruising and the pain and the swelling that you expect possibly doesn't even develop if you take it uh, quickly enough. Um, there is no, there's nothing to worry about in terms of dosage and strengths. Um, here's Arnica D6, Arsenicum 30C, Belladonna 200C. Um, forget about the letters. The letters are refer to this uh, dilution process I was talking about before. Um, a 200C has been through this process where you do 1 to 99 200 times. If it's called D or X sometimes as well, then they've done it not 1 to 99, but 1 to 9. So they used a decimal scale instead of a centesimal scale. In practical, for practical purposes, it turns out to make no difference at all. It's just a cultural difference. One is typically done in America and, and uh, one is typically done in, in Germany, for instance. Uh, but it makes no difference. The only thing to look at is the number. The number says how many times it has been through the dilution and that uh, describes the potency or the strength, if you like, of the remedy. And I would suggest, if you want to play around with it, use a 30. A 30 is a nice um, middle-ish kind of a remedy, a potency, sorry, which will be strong enough to work for most cases, that you, most things that you'd want to treat, most acute or first aid situations. Use a 30, maybe a 200, but 30 is easy. Forget about the, the letters, they don't matter. The you know, Arnica, Arsenicum album, Belladonna, that's the name of the remedy. So that's obviously important. That's the substance that that remedy is made from. So that's what that remedy is. And then the number is the potency. And if you go for a 30, you can't really go wrong for home treatment uh, purposes. Homeopathic medicine is absorbed through mucous membrane. Typically in humans and in animals, we just take it in the mouth, sometimes in cows and you, you'll do, you use the vaginal um, mucous membrane, but humans tend to take it uh, in the mouth. And um, whether you use powders, tablets, pills, drops, crystals, whatever form it comes in, makes no difference whatsoever. They're all just carriers of that um, electromagnetic signal uh, that we talked about at the beginning. Um, I tend to use pills, they have a longer shelf life and the animals don't think they taste bad, but you can just as easily use liquids. If you do use liquids for animals, I suggest you make sure to ask for the, the rubber teat, um, uh, like in these, this, this picture here, because if you don't, you're gonna get a little bottle that's very difficult to get anything out of, unless the animal sits there and opens their mouth for a, for a while for you. But um, the size of the pill or the tablet doesn't matter. The amount of pills, tablets or drops you give doesn't matter. A dose is a dose. It's not weight related. If you're treating a chihuahua puppy that weighs nothing or you're treating a horse that weighs half a ton, um, a dose is a dose. A pill will be enough. Three pills will not be more than one pill if you give them at the same time. It's a signal you're giving. Remember, it's not chemistry of anything. It's not milligrams of anything. So a dose is a dose. Um, always give it away from food. I gen generally say no food for 10 minutes before and after. So you literally just put it in. You don't have to ram it down their throat because it's not about getting it into the stomach. You just want to put it in the corner of the mouth or put it by the gum. Um, because it's just 
it just has to go in there and touch the mucous membrane and then the, the dose is absorbed straight away. Store at room temperature, away from strong smells. Um, antidotes are things that can stop homeopathy working and are typically things with strong taste and smell, garlic, um, aromatherapy oils, things like that are best kept away from homeopathy and away from animals receiving homeopathy. I think I'm gonna speed up. Um, yes, my take home message would be, whether it's for humans or for animals, um, don't take any doctor's or vet's word for it that it's incurable if you haven't tried homeopathy. And if it's a chronic problem or a life-threatening problem, um, go and see a professional. Um, and then I would really say that disorders of the immune system, which are very, very common in dogs, allergic skin disease, irritable bowel syndromes, um, classical homeopathy. In my dream world, that's the first thing anybody does uh, before they embark on any other treatment. But dogs are still being put to sleep for conditions that are entirely curable. So that should be my, my take home message. Um, if anybody would like to read more, uh, I <laughs> humbly put my own book up there again. Uh, there are loads of books out there written by amazing uh, vets. Um, Peter Gregory, John Saxton, Chris Day, Jack Hall, Richard Allport, lots of colleagues have written fantastic books. I have to say that my favorite when I was just beginning to look into homeopathy uh, was Don Hamilton's book, Homeopathic Care for Cats and Dogs. It's more thorough than many of the others and explains the whole concept of holistic treatment really well. Um, I think there's a newer uh, edition with a different front page, but um, that would be one of my favorites. And just about homeopathy in general, George Vitulkas is one of the best homeopaths in the world. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Uh, he writes about homeopathy for, for humans, but one of the many beautiful things about the system of medicine, of course, um, I think, is that it's medicine that's been treated on human, medicine, sorry, that's been tested on humans that we're using to, to treat animals. Um, rather than the other way around. There is no difference between treating humans and treating animals if you're interested in homeopathy. Same thing. Okay, this is one of my, this is Luna, one of my patients who was going to be put to sleep uh, from an autoimmune disease who is still doing, doing well. Okay, I think my time is, is up. We've got a little bit of time for questions possibly. Are you with us, Sandra? Uh, someone's with us. Hi there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Sorry, my video isn't uh, working. Uh, so I'm, I'm moderating. And so just encouraging everybody who's in attendance, if they do have questions, either type it into the chat or you can request a video question to, to on the video stream to ask your question um, in person. I, I have a, a quick question, just mm -hmm. uh, while everybody is contemplating all their lovely questions. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. I found it really interesting. Um, my question is about how important is the diet in terms of the home, homeopathy uh, methodology and how diet figures into that type of treatment? It's a great question. I I mean, obviously, if you're um, my, my, my book um, talks about diet. Uh, and I think when you talk about dog health, you have to talk about parasites, you have to talk about diet, you have to talk about vaccination, you have to talk about neutering. So those, so a healthy lifestyle is obviously important and diet is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. But if you're talking about when someone comes to me for homeopathy, um, diet is certainly not the first thing I talk about. In fact, I ask them typically to keep everything else the same. 
uh, because I my expectation is that in most cases um, you know, I always have to be careful about general statements, but my expectation will typically be that I'm going to cure this problem with homeopathy. And if we change too many things at the same time, it's difficult to assess the effect of each step that we make. So typically from the outset, I will ask them not to make any other changes, You know, not to start other treatment forms, not to change the diet, not to start supplements, um, everything else the same. And then we are adding a homeopathic remedy and then we'll see the effect from that. But nobody leaves at the end of a course of treatment without us having a, a sort of finishing session where we talk about correct use of vaccination, where we talk about diet. And I will, um, I don't believe there's a one size fits all diet, but most dogs I think are better off on a, on a raw diet or at least a home uh, cooked diet. But I never start there because I don't want to risk it confusing the assessment of the homeopathic treatment. So it's typically what I do at the end when I send them out the door, when their problem has been cured, just to send them out the door with some healthy lifestyle advice at the end. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I do have another question then while, while we're waiting. How, how common is this type of approach in terms of um, the average vets? Like, is, is this something that you can seek out, like how would somebody seek out uh, this specific type of I think approach? It, I from think it depends enormously on where you are in the world. In Scandinavia, um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, homeopathy is not very well known at all, uh, including homeopathy for people. But if you go, you know, into Germany, France, Spain, um, and the UK, uh, people know what it is, and most people will have had some remedies themselves um, but, but when they were children, probably, if, if nothing else. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a greater awareness about it. Um, there are also different regulations in most countries that I'm aware of to treat animals. You have to be a veterinary surgeon. Um, there are a few exceptions. I think Canada is one. Uh, I don't know of any others, but generally, whereas you can, a, a human homeopath doesn't have to be a doctor. Uh, many, many are, but many, many are not, uh, and it's not a requirement. But if you want to treat animals using homeopathy in most countries, uh, certainly in the UK and in, in Denmark, uh, the two places where I practice, you need to be a veterinary surgeon. Um, some vets refer, uh, and word of mouth, I think, is is... It's the way that most most um, people come to someone like me. Very often, tragically, they will have gone through everything conventional medicine had to offer. And when you're at the end and when they've been told, you know, euthanasia is now very much being discussed, um, it's often when people start kind of Googling and becoming a bit desperate. And, and that's, that's often when they show up for the first time when all hope is is lost. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad place to start. And, and very, very often um, the problems are cured. But then people are often left quite, I mean, it varies how people react. If they've had a dog who's been medicated for years and who is now due to be put to sleep and they go and see a homeopath and within a few months, the animal is healthy and off all medication. Uh, and that is a fairly typical scenario. Um, some people, I mean, obviously, people, most people are grateful, but some people are also quite upset, maybe even angry, that they had to go through all of that. Why didn't anyone just say straight away, you've got an allergic dog, go see a homeopath? Um, and that is really my wish. And that's sort of, well, what I'm doing here now is <laughs> just trying to spread that awareness. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I'm sitting here now. There are a lot of people and a lot of who, who are not aware, and too many vets who are not aware. Loads of vets will refer, but lots of vets don't know. Lots of vets will genuinely say, "This can't. There's no answer for this problem." You know, you're better off having him put to sleep. When a home, as a homeopath, you know I, this could have been solved. I know it could have, and that's quite tragic when you hear that over and over again. Um, so, you know, more awareness would be wonderful. Do you think that there is a financial incentive for veterinarians to treat traditionally because they can charge 
for the medication, they can charge for the test, they can charge for multiple sessions. Well, I, don't I mean, think, I know I don't it think anyone, dire. I don't think anyone becomes a vet for any other reason than a deep, deep desire to help animals. You know, I mean, if you just wanted to make money, there are easier and clean, cleaner ways to do that for sure. Um, you know, everybody who's a vet have gone that way because they want to help animals. But you're working within, I mean, I've been there. You know, you're working within the paradigm you, that you've been taught. You're working with the tools that you've been taught. Um, and and it has its strengths and it has its limitations. It's amazing sometimes in acute disease, acute life-threatening disease. It's amazing for things that need surgical answers. But for chronic problems, I mean, a chronic means that it hasn't been cured you know it's ongoing uh, and most of what vets deal with are chronic problems and and they are never solved but the individual vet doesn't necessarily know that 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 there is another way to go um i, I absolutely refuse to believe that any that that you know it, it, any consulting room with a vet and an owner and an animal the vet is there to help um but sometimes they can't and I wish that they would. I wish that all vets would know about homeopathy and and um, just prefer sooner. Lots and lots of animals could be saved. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. Also, it doesn't have to be a choice between: Are we going to see a conventional vet? Or are we going to see a homeopath? Um, there are strengths, and you know, conventional medicine is great for some stuff. Homeopathy is great for other stuff, uh, and some animals, at least for part of the time can benefit from from both types of treatment um but but it's homeopathy is certainly underused for dogs that's for sure and it is amazing what it can do as a vet who is trained as a vet and who has worked as a conventional vet it is miraculous on a daily basis to see things that i know are incurable because that's what i've been taught and i see them cured every day it's it's fantastic, but it's also sometimes almost hard to talk to colleagues because they know that, you know, it can't be, but it is. So, uh, so let's, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to talk about it more. I want more people to be aware and more dogs to benefit. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so do we have any more questions from the audience in attendance right now? Awesome. Well, thank you, Lise. That was incredibly enlightening and very informative. And and uh, my thanks uh, on behalf of the audience and the organizers um, for all your amazing information and your time. Thank you. Today. Can I say thank you to you and thank you so much to Sandra for this amazing event and all this information that's being made made available. We're all you know we're all working for the same cause, I think, and it's it's amazing. Um, what you're putting together here. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're very welcome. Bye. Thank you. Have yourself a great afternoon. You too. Bye.